Just stop and think about that for a moment. I know this is really a side rabbit. I'm not really talking about the, the greatest command of the law, but just stop and think about for a moment what Jesus identified as the big thing. I mean, the church loves to go digging through the Old Testament to find stuff we don't like that people are doing so we can get up and put it on our church sign and do a Sunday school lesson on it. The wrath of God's about to come on people because they're doing X, Y, Z. Where'd you find that? Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. When they ask Jesus the same question, same question, what's the biggest one? Jesus skips all the don'ts and picks out two do's. Because the heartbeat of God's never been don'ts. The heartbeat of God's always been do. Can we prove that in the Bible? You can prove it in the Garden of Eden. God creates man out of dust and breathes into him. What's the first law that God gives him? Almost every Christian will go, first law is don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Wrong. First law is be fruitful and multiply. Two do's. Because God is all about do, not about don't. God had to put don'ts so we wouldn't kill each other. We didn't have the Holy Spirit teach us how to love our neighbor. So we had to have fences and restrictions. We didn't have the internal plumb line of the Spirit to teach us how to walk. So we had to have the walls and the structures. But the do's, the Holy Spirit's been putting the do, the D-O, down into the heart of man from the beginning going, here's what you should be doing. So if you look at God's commands as grievous, then you don't know the heart of your Father. So when you say, boy, when God tells you what to do or not to do, it's, the, it's do. It's the Father speaking to it. So they say to Jesus, what's the, best, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Surely they expect, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Because if, if you fired that little chestnut out in the modern church, you'd get a whole list of stuff you're not supposed to do. What do you think's the biggest? This is how we talk in the church. What do you think the biggest sin is in the church? But why are we talking about what the biggest sin is in the church? We, we ain't even figured out who the biggest Savior is in the church half the time. We, we're still trying to spot who the biggest sin is. We're all fighting over on what righteousness looks like and how, you know, what we're supposed to be doing to get God's favor and how can I get more anointing. And the reality is Jesus gets asked what you do, what, what shouldn't you do? And Jesus goes, I'll give you what you should do. It's the thing that's the hardest to do. And if you did it, you'd fulfill the whole law and the whole prophet. That's pretty awesome. To the church at Rome and to the church at Galatia, the apostle Paul says, loving your neighbor is the fulfillment of the law. If I were to say to you today, how did Jesus fulfill the law? What would your response initially be? Here's what mine would have been. Jesus never sinned. And that fulfilled the law. And there's not a verse in the New Testament that says the fulfillment of the law is sinless perfection. The New Testament over and over, and I'm, this, I'm doing this literally, and over again, Gospels, Galatians, Romans, at least there and John alludes love fulfills the law so when I say Jesus fulfilled the law how'd he do it he loved the law was the, the it was never about you doing all of the right things or not doing the wrong things it was to fulfill the law on the hook of the law Jesus says on the law and the prophets hang these two so you got you've got love God love each other I look at them like, like coat hooks on a wall. On these two hang the law and the prophets. So where Israel had worn the law like a coat and worn the prophets like a coat, Jesus says on two hooks, two things on which the law hangs and the prophets hang, which was love God and love your neighbor. It was to give upward vertically and to give horizontally. And whatever came in the Old Testament was always about that. It was always to, to promote those twin pillars. So there, it becomes natural then in a world in which everything for Judaism is natural. We talked about this a little bit last night. Everything's tangible. That you would need physical examples of the law and the prophets. So what Israel has is Moses is a physical example of the law and Elijah is a physical example of the prophets. And so when heaven opens and speaks, what they hear God say is, only one of these three is my beloved son. He's the one you should be listening to. And when the cloud leaves, there's only one man left on the field. And the purpose of New Covenant Gospel preaching is to eliminate all competitors on the field. 
Eliminate the competitor of self-righteousness. Eliminate the competitor of ambition. Eliminate the competitor of challenge. The things we love to put out in front of people, eliminate all of them, leave one man left on the field, and the work is finished by that one man, Jesus Christ. I've been sharing this in our Tuesday meetings. Those of you that's been following along in our John series heard me say this a couple weeks ago, but when you hit that moment in John 11 when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and the chief priests all get together and the Pharisees and they're not happy that Lazarus has been raised from the dead. And I think they're not happy for a number of reasons, but Jesus, they've got to get rid of him. And they make one of the most powerful statements in the, to me in the entire New Testament when they say, if we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And I had that painted on the wall of my office in my church when I was pastoring in Missouri. And we had a wall that, imagine that window's not there. And so it took up about that much space. And so I said, I want that. I want just one line straight across that wall. And my door to leave to go into the sanctuary for Sunday morning was about right where that door is. And so every morning, Every Sunday morning, I'd wait until I heard that first note on the platform so that I could just walk out and walk onto the platform, walk into the atmosphere of worship with our church. And I'd go to that door and flip the light off and turn. And every week I would read that to remind myself, when you walk out on that platform, if you'll leave Jesus alone, everyone will believe in him. And my challenge was to always find out how much less of us we could leave up there. How much less of this church we could leave up there. How much less of this ministry can we leave on the field tonight? So that when you leave, it's not about, boy, boy, he brought out some stuff, or what a guy, what a lesson, what a word. You know. But the more it can be just centered on the man, Christ Jesus, that's what's transforming your life. It's that, it's that you've begun to center on the man. Christ Jesus. That Jesus is the only one left on the field. Remember when you were on the field with him for so long? Remember when it was all, a lot of it was about effort and what you did? And you got to the end of every week and you stacked them up in front of God and you just prayed that it was enough. And you judged whether or not it was enough by how good things went in your life. And if you had a bad week at work, that was evidence that there was you know, you didn't do quite enough. And if you had a good week, then maybe you had done enough. And if you got the raise, you must be giving just the right amount. And if you didn't get the raise, well, that's God's way of breaking your heart financially. And, and uh, we, we read into everything. People are still doing it right now. They're doing it, with, they're doing it with coronavirus. What's God trying to teach America? Because we love being on the field with Jesus. We love believing that there is something that we can do that makes the eternal difference of our victory rather than he finished the work. So many of us are living in a Peter mindset, Peter, James, and John mindset. We watch the glory of God move and we still lean back to Moses' finished work. Because when a cloud come down and a tabernacle gets built, what the text had just said was Moses finished the work. And I've spent years preaching in Moses' finished work churches. And Moses' finished work is pay attention to the do's and the don'ts. Sacrifice yourself. Put yourself on an altar. Make your wave offering smell good before the Lord. It's all Old Testament imagery. Get God's people together to humble themselves and pray so that God can hear from heaven and forgive us of our sins and heal us of our land. Why? Because we have a Moses finished the work gospel. And we point people towards what they are supposed to do and they're not supposed to do. Rather than just leave Jesus alone on the field. Yes. 